Hey everybody, it's Norm from Tested and welcome to a special on location episode of Projections. We are of course covering virtual reality content and a lot of games announced at this year's E3 and a lot of first hands-on time with a bunch of games as well. Uh, one of the games previously announced I got a chance to play is Lone Echo 2, the sequel to Ready at Dawn's expansive narrative zero-g story where you play Jack a Robot who's stranded with your human companion, Liv. It's an amazing game, you haven't played it yet, and Lone Echo 2 looks like it's gonna take it even further. And I had a chance to chat with Ready at Dawn developer, Nathan, who's the game director, about the game. Let's go hear that first. So I just played a little bit of Lone Echo 2, and I'm here chatting with Nathan, who's the game director. Uh, the first game, obviously, massive uh, single player experience, of course, with very interesting. Now, multiple multiplayer experiences, yep. Uh, but you guys are focusing on a, another long single player game, is that right, with Lone Echo yeah. 2? Yeah, we are. And, and definitely the heart and soul of kind of Lone Echo and Logan, Lone Echo 2. It's, you know, it's actually really a very personal story about two characters, but set in this kind of awe-inspiring backdrop that uses compelling locomotion to be able to have agency in exploring this cool futuristic world. Well, what struck me jumping in is, like you said in the first game, you have a very intimate story between you, the robot, mm -hmm. and then the human, Liv, and you don't, double down on like having more characters, like like looking into other one person's eyes and interacting with an NPC was so powerful, but at least from what I've seen so far, you kind of still have that as your core. It absolutely is the core. However, we're not talking about right now, but there are more characters in this game. Um, and that's something we're really interested in is like VR is such a powerful medium for storytelling and emotion. And so we explored certain range of emotions in, in Lone Echo, and we want to kind of expand that and, and really see what else we can kind of just like convey to people on a very you know, personal like level. What, what are you finding in terms of the types of characters you can design that we as players react or have the most emotional response to? Obviously, human avatars with eye contact. We have robots. There are amorphous, you know, creatures. Yep. And so, what, what are you finding? Uh, well, the interesting thing is the player character. Like, it was very deliberate, the kind of performance calibration of mm. Jack as a character, because in some ways he needs to be a, a vessel that kind of um, responds to the player's own emotions without kind of stepping over them. And so that's like an interesting aspect in building a protagonist in VR, where you really, you really have to design it in a way that you're not conveying an emotion that the player's not experiencing. Even though you're scripting out the responses that Jack might have. Yeah, well, we have to be careful. Like, if he suddenly has this, like, strongly emotional moment of, like, shock or disbelief or what have you, if, that, if that's not in line with what the player is experiencing on a personal level, there's a disconnect there, and it's actually presence breaking. Mm. So, in some ways, like, Jack is sort of the empty vessel that we kind of, like, make sure we calibrate his interplay with other characters, that we kind of explore the emotional range on the other characters in the world, and at the same time reward the player's own kind of presence and emotion in that storytelling. Now, of course, the other big breakthrough with the first game was the locomotion, how you get around that zero yep. G environment, which you've doubled down on with Echo Combat, Echo Arena, those players are very well versed in that movement and you allow them to do a, a lot more in those that version of the game that you do in the, the single player. Single player is a different pace. Yep. Uh, is that intentional? Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, that said, we, we are looking at kind of expanding kind of the gameplay uh, kind of repertoire in this game because VR has been around a little longer, you have more people in it. So fundamentally, it's still you know a very narrative-driven adventure and exploration game. But as you saw today, we're starting to kind of escalate some of the gameplay systems that really double down on the magic of like hands and body presence. And so a lot of the new things, many we have a few more in reserve, but they really kind of accentuate what's powerful about the core locomotion model of the game. A lot of grabbing, a lot of pulling levers. More, more tools, more tools that kind of reward hand presence. Um, I mean. It, Bigger game, longer storyline, more exploratory content, mm. um, more characters. So in many ways, it's kind of like taking the foundation we established from the first game and seeing like, oh, all the little envelopes where we can push it even more and kind of run with what was magical about the, you know, the first experience. Do you think of the game as a series of environments and puzzles moving from space to space, room to room? Is that how it's designed? Um, not, not necessarily. I, I think for the section you played, we were kind of building up a mechanic of introducing to these like bio-threat ticks. Mm -hmm. And so in some ways you have to understand sort of the power ecosystem and like how you can leverage 
larger scale intera physical interactions in the world. So in, in some ways that is designed to kind of onboard you to that. But in, in some ways like Lone Echo is about sort of the sum of the parts. Like it's kind of this just orchestra where you're, you're really at the part of it trying to convey this very powerful personal emotional experience and have a high degree of agency in the player. And so this game will very much have that as well. Very cool. And then the thing that I like also, interactions, like levers and things. Are you, are you populating the world full of those things? And yeah, and, and like making sure we're honoring the affordances of that, that if you see something, it should behave as you expect it to behave. Um, and you saw some new mechanics today where in Lone Echo, a lot of the physical interactions was, were smaller in terms of like pulling a lever or switch. But here we're introducing kind of larger layered physical interactions, like the, the crane, the, the multi-axis, the gantry, and, where yeah. it's like, you kind of you can kind of look around and, and puzzle out how you would expect it to work, and it should work that way. And just the feeling of being able to operate these like larger, kind of cooler physical devices that, as this futuristic android, you're equipped to do. Um, that's part of the fantasy for sure that we want to. Move. In terms of the environment, the first game took you from a pretty big ship to just like a really big outdoor in the space environment, is that something that players can expect as well? It will be even bigger in this game, yeah. So you, you saw about 40 minutes in, and so it's still kind of ramping up to the story and building up the mysteries of uh, Liv and Jack kind of trying to figure out what's going on in this new mysterious world they find themselves in. Um, but the training wheels will absolutely come off, and you have this really large open world again with even more kind of diverse environments, more diverse narrative and, and storytelling and gameplay as well, a lot of new mechanics. What are the kind of emotions that you want the gamers to feel because it is set in space? And you know, is it claustrophobia, is it isolation, is it? Uh, I mean, those can come to play, but I think what was magical with the first game, it's just the joy and freedom of being in the vastness of space. Like that first airlock mode in Lone Echo where it's a moment of like terror and exhilaration, but it's very uplifting too. It's incredibly powerful. It yeah. kind of lets you on a virtual level experience something that most of us unfortunately will not be able to do in our lifetimes. And, and so yeah, Lone Echo is at its heart is like optimistic futurism. So it's definitely not about imparting like fear or claustrophobia for comfort reasons as well. Um, yeah, but I mean a whole, whole spectrum of emotions in, the, in that space. Absolutely. Well, I can't wait to play more of the game. Thank you so much, oh, Nathan, yeah. for chatting with us. Thank you so much. My pleasure. So what I got to play was uh, a short segment of the game. And as you heard Nathan say, it was really uh, more of an onboarding for some of the new mechanics. It is, of course, a zero-G based game. You are on an abandoned ship or space station, and you as a robot can propel yourself with rockets, as you may know from things like Echo Arena or Echo Combat. But like the first Lone Echo, it is a little more of a slower paced game. You're grabbing parts of the environment, pulling yourself across, and really exploring the space, looking around, and here you're interacting with some enemies. And these enemies come in this, these, the form of these amorphous bugs that float around and they get attracted to energy sources like you or to live. And you have to go basically navigate them away from the doors, away from the panels, away from levers, so you can make your way through the world. Really felt like a series of puzzles. And interestingly enough, there were different ways to solve those puzzles. So for example, in one of the segments, I entered a room, I could see that I needed to get past some doors and it had these floating enemies attached to the panels. I needed to get them away from the panels and drawn to other electrical sources. So I could either use my body to attract them or I could find things like a charged up battery to use as almost like a magnet to pull them away or they had, there were these cranes in the room that I could then move along the gantry to get in place and pull the enemies into them. It was really more like puzzles and as the level progressed, the puzzles got a little more complicated. I had to think about the ways to interact with the room and interact with my uh, char human character um, because you can solve them a bunch of different ways. I'm looking forward to seeing what other mechanics they're going to put in this game and like Nathan said the game's going to really open up and the, one of my favorite parts about the first game was when you went out into space. I hope there's a lot more of that uh, in this game as well. The other game I got to play at Oculus's booth was Beat Saber. Now you know Beat Saber is already out, it's on the Quest, it's on desktop VR, uh, but they did announce and launch a new music pack, a partnership with Imagine Dragons, and what I got to play was Beat Saber in 360. That's right, so Beat Saber as you know it, the blocks are coming on a single rail down the center, but as I got to play it, 
the rails could come in any direction. It was super interesting. It actually made the game feel more immersive. My body got more into it, and it's a real testament to the level design, essentially, of the, the, these songs, because the programmers can stack up beats to drag you and pull your attention in a certain part, certain directions. And also, there's a, a now a new arrow that floats above you that swings left and right, so you get a sense, a cue, as to what direction you should be looking at next. Uh, the levels are definitely more complicated that way, but even on normal difficulty, it was a ton of fun. And if the idea is that they're gonna design levels to be both the single one directional rail and also 360, that's a lot more work for them, but I think as Beat Saber fans, you're gonna have a lot more content. I can't wait to see what they do with Beat Saber going forward. Uh, we'll have more coverage of the games I'm playing here at E3 in future episodes. If we have other questions, post them in the comments below, and I'll see you next time.